with that. Okay, so welcome everyone to, um, to this final One World Property Seminar um, of the spring season. And uh, first of all, Alessandra um, and I um, will be handing over the chair uh, next um, for next session to uh, Julian Beristiki and Nina Gantet. Um, but we'd both very much like to thank you all for, for sharing this, um, the spring season's talks uh, with us. Um, and the, the season will restart on the 15th of April uh, with talks of Peter Mortis and Marcus Haydenreich. Um, so just a few um, sort of administrative announcements. Um, if you'd like to ask questions uh, during the talk, there are a few different ways to, to do that. Uh, either you can write your question in the chat, in the chat and other experts might answer your question, or if not, Alessandra and I will, uh, will alert the speakers to the question. Um, or if you prefer to ask your question um, live, you can just raise your hand uh, and we'll invite you to, uh, to unmute yourself at an appropriate uh, point in time. Okay, so in that case, I think um, there's nothing else to say except to introduce the first speaker um, for today, which is Hendrik Weber from the University of Bath, and he'll be talking about phase transitions for 543. So, so thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Alessandra, for, for having me. It's very nice to, to be here, part of this One World Probability uh, Seminar. Um, so today I want to, um, I mean, this is uh, the first of, of the series of two talks, and uh, this is about a joint work with, with AJ Chandra from Imperial College and uh, Trish uh, Gunartman, who is uh, the second speaker of this um, session. So this was essentially uh, Trish, uh, the second half only of Trish's PhD thesis. So he has finished here in, uh, in Bath in the summer and has since moved over to, to, to do a postdoc in, in Geneva now. And um, so the, the plan for this is that I, I'll introduce the topic and tell you kind of about our main result and put it a bit into perspective. And then uh, I think Trish in the second half will tell you the ugly truth about uh, how one has to, how we, I mean, the real work. So I get to play, show you some, some nice pictures and take the fun part. Uh, so I want to, want to start and uh, so perhaps start by explaining what this, um, this five to the four theory from the, from the first slide was. So, so let's start with this slightly formal definition. It's a, it's a probability distribution on on functions, and the functions is, is a bit in, in a quotation marks for now, over some set in RD. And at least formally, you, you should think of something like that. So you have here some, uh, some energy functional or the Lagrangian of your, um, of your uh, function phi. So you have here uh, this, 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 this H1 norm, and then you have here some, some nonlinear term, and if you want even some quadratic term, and then you just uh, take a, you want an infinite Lebesgue measure on, on, on functions, okay? So, I mean, this expression is purely formal and doesn't make any sense as it stands. So, um, what you should think of really is that you discretize your domain. So, you look at some, some grid lambda epsilon that I've plotted here. So, you should think of this as being your domain lambda. And I take some lattice discretization of some width epsilon here. And then here, the space of functions on this lattice is, of course, a finite dimensional RD. And then you uh, just take uh, I mean, then this, you take a, take a discrete approximation of this H1 norm and you take a discrete approximation of this nonlinear linearity and you take a discrete approximation of these integrals and then you just write this formula. And then the object that we want to, to work with you is, is the limit as you let the um, lattice with epsilon go to zero. There's an issue here, let me just mention that right away, which is that you, there's this issue of renormalization. So you have to actually tweak the parameters as you let the lattice go to zero. and I brush that under the rug as much as I possibly can without lying too much throughout the talk. So I'll just pretend it doesn't exist, trying not to lie too much. But that's the object that we are going to be dealing with. So I have a couple of slides that are supposed to tell you why you would might want to care about that, that measure. So the first thing, um, and that's closest in spirit to the, to the topic of this talk, is that one should really think of this five to the four theory as a continuous easing model. And um, the, I mean, here up on the left side of the slide, I've just recalled what the easing model is, which I presume that pretty much, I mean, most of you will know. So it's a easing model here is just a measure on, um, on random functions, if you want, taking values only in plus minus one, uh, plus minus one on some domain. So each, uh, each side in a lattice is just associated either the value plus or minus one. And I've indicated this here with this on this picture red being plus one and blue being minus one. So it's a measure on configurations of this type. And you have here this Hamiltonian, which essentially, 
and you have an interaction term here, but essentially just counts the number of uh, say neighbors that disagree. And then you have this weighted Gibbs measure. And I'm, I'm going, I mean, this, I think I can be pretty quick and mo most of you will know that. And you have this parameter beta in your model, which is the inverse temperature. And uh, so if you, so, so on the right-hand side, I've got at least an intuitive, um, I hope intuitive way of how one should think of this five to the four model as a discretization or as a continuous version of that. So here in that, in that Gibbs measure here, you have in principle a, a, a reference measure, the product measure of, of infinitely many uh, plus minus one Dirac's. And if one wanted to make the spin continuous, a very natural way of doing it would just be to replace here that, uh, that plus minus uh, the, the, the sum of two delta masses as in the reference measure just by such a measure here where you have um, I mean, just a continuous spin and you don't force your spins at each lattice side to be equal to plus minus one, but you encourage them to be close to plus minus one. So that's what this, this would do, okay? And then in the, if you do this replacement, then the interaction here, which essentially just counts the number of neighbors that disagree, could be replaced by, by such a term, which is corresponding, corresponds to this, H, um, this H1 norm. So this would be at least the, the, the lattice version of the A of this, of the five to the four period period. Which, um, yeah, which you should think of as the easing model just with a continuous spin. Um, there's, there's a completely different angle from which one can come uh, at the series, and that's, that's from field theory, and that's something that people, I mean, have been looking at a long, for, for a long time. So this is, a, this is a, one of the, the simplest um, field theories, uh, I mean, models that, 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 that uh, if you want to construct a quantum, uh, rigorous, rigorously construct a quantum field theory, uh, with interaction, then this is one of the easiest uh, test cases that you can write down for that. Um, I'm not going to explain to you too much um, uh, what, in which sense, but if you want to rigorously reconstruct a quantum field theory, you have to construct such a measure and check a number of axioms. So they're, they're called osterwalder schrader axioms, and I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, but um, so, so the problem of, of construction of this measure has been resolved in three dimensions, or in two, two is easier, but in three dimensions by, by many people. But the, the first major, I mean, one major contribution here is this, uh, this, uh, this famous paper by Glim and Jaffe. And um, that's a bit, uh, one slightly unfortunate bit about this story here is that in, in this QFT business, one would really do like to do it in four dimension, which is the, the physical dimension because it's space and time. And unfortunately, there are triviality results that this is not possible. So this was, in, in the 80s already proved completely four dimensions strictly larger than four and, and conjectured in dimension equal to four. But the full proof that this that for this triviality result in four dimensions is, uh, is due to uh, Eisenman and Dumilio Copin from, um, I think, about uh, two, almost two, one and a half years ago. And I think, if I remember correctly, one of the very first probability uh, um, one world probability seminars was actually given by Hugo on, on this paper. So I, I think it's, uh, I mean, if you've been, uh, if you've been with the seminar for a while, then, then, then you may remember. Um, there's another context in which this has been attracting a lot of attention over the last years, and that's in this business of singular SPDEs. So, um, uh, so, so I mean, one, one thing that, that one li likes to do, say, over RD is if you have some measure, you like to sometimes construct a Markov process which has this measure which is reversible with respect to this measure and that you might find that a good idea, for example, actually you really just if you want to draw samples from that measure, if you want to run a Markov chain that has this as invariant measure, um, then it's often a good idea to just construct a Markov process that has this invariant measure and run the process for a while. And one of the, the standard ways of doing that, if you have such a finite dimensional Gibbs measure here, is just to run this Langevin dynamic. So you take these, uh, this uh, SDE which has the uh, with a retype for people who arrive there. Okay, um, so you take this gradient uh, gradient type drift here, and then you have a noise term, and uh, and and then this is one of the the standard candidates for um, for constructing such a dynamic for this measure. And there's an infinite dimensional analog. So for the uh, for the um, for this this uh, for the kind of measure that we were looking at, then you would have. Um, I mean this non-linear non term in your PDE, which corresponds here to some sort of gradient of the semitonian. So you have here, um, uh, you have here the, uh, if you want the A2 gradient of this, of this Dirichlet energy, and here the, the gradient, if you want, of this quartic, inter quartic interaction. Uh, I've here not put a first order to second, first order term. And then here, this, uh, this space-time white noise corresponds to the DW. It's an infinite dimensional version of the DW. And 
I mean, many of you, I mean, or some of you, I mean, will, will be aware of the fact that SPDEs of this type have been studied a lot in the last years. And sort of that's also how I came at this problem. So there's, I mean, there are these works by, by my particular prominent by, by Martin on regularity structures and Massimiliano and others on, on power control distributions. And of course, there has been a lot of dynamic on this uh, following these, these, these gro uh, groundbreaking work. And, but, but the thing you have to should have in mind is really that. Interrupt a little bit. There's been a question, um, Stephen. Yeah, just a quick clarification. So the, uh, the phi four term gives you the phi cubed. Uh, but the phi squared term has disappeared here. Is that what you've got under renormalization in this equation? Uh, no. Uh, yes. Well, so, uh, yes, for the first term, phi phi to the four term gives you phi to the yeah. three, and the phi squared term I've just in this slide said mu equal to zero. Sorry. Okay, I just wonder whether that was a subtle issue there in the analysis. Um, no, I mean I think at this level I really uh, haven't been consistent with my own, own rotation. I should also have put. <laughs> No worries, Henry, just, just, just in case it was a subtle thing. I mean, there is a bit of a subtlety with the renormalization, and it has to do with the quadratic term, but I'd prefer not to discuss it here if you don't mind. Okay. Um, but I mean, the thing to think about here is that if you, if you come from the easing world more, I think you should really think of the dynamics given by this SPDE as the Glauber dynamics for the, uh, for the, um, for the model. So I mean, the, or heat bath dynamic that, that some of you may know. Another completely different angle that one can take at measures of this form and that many people have been interested in the last, last time is that these measures actually also play, play a role in, in Hamiltonian deterministic PDE. Um, so, I mean, now I'm going to make five complex values, but okay. Uh, and then people have actually known since the 90s that these are, these are important measures also in the context, for example, here for this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So there's no noise in the equation. It's, it's a completely deterministic Hamiltonian system. Um, but it's still relevant to start that, I mean, this is the, if you want, the Gibbs measure for this, uh, for this uh, deterministic dynamics. And uh, it's, it's been known since the 90s, uh, famous work by Jean Bourgain, that uh, it's, it's interesting to start, uh, to, to look at these Hamiltonian PDE started in this random, in this random initial data. And for, for one of the things what that it allowed them to do is to construct solutions uh, of much lower regularity than, than, than you can do usually. And there's been also a lot of activity in that over the last years. And I just want to mention here, for example, one work from last year or from the last two years by, by uh, Deng, Mahmoud, and uh, Yu, who, um, who, who managed to extend these Bourgain results to, to higher order exponents here. So where you have a higher peak. So, so this was just a bit of, um, this was just a, bit of a, a panorama of where one might encounter these, these measures and where we might, um, might, why you might be interested in them. Let me just, I have just two slides on, on what they actually mean. So how do you actually prove um, what, what, I mean, how do you actually, I mean, how do you, how do you prove that, that you can pass to this limit epsilon to zero? And so let me perhaps start with the Gaussian case. So when you don't have a nonlinearity, and again, I've put the new equal to zero here just for, um, just, uh, for the moment. So then this is always possible. So this is um, the Gaussian free field. And I'm, I'm, I'm brushing here a bit under the rug issue with the, with the, with the average, but okay. So, 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 but in principle, you can just write down here, um, this expression here, you can just interpret if you want as a random Fourier series. So you say, you say you're on the d-dimensional torus and then you just write down this random Fourier series. So you have a one over K here, which corresponds to this, this gradient term. And then uh, for, each of these, uh, for each of these coefficients, you put an IID, well, essentially IID, you want the thing to be real valued, but except for that IID um, uh, Gaussian, and then this always converges, okay? So it's, there's, there's no problem. Uh, the only issue is that this, this thing converges, but it converges only if you're happy to go to very, very low regularity spaces. So you're only, uh, th this thing only converges, um, uh, I mean, not in functions, but only in spaces of generalized functions. And if you have a reasonable means of measuring what it means to have negative regularity, then here the regularity that it depends on the dimension. So in, in two dimension, you would, or would have something that is just about not a function, and that's this log correlated Gaussian free field that many of you will have encountered in, in other contexts. In three dimensions, it still converges. You just have to be happy to work in, in things that are really distributions. So this is now a distribution of regularity minus a half, and minus, and then the, every, every extra dimension costs you half a degree of differentiability. So you can play this game in any dimension you want, but, it, uh, but you pay, pay more and more regularity for it. Um, 
And so that then, so this that's all fine. So for the linear problem, for the linear model, no, the Gaussian model, no problem. But then this starts to to hurt once you um, once you put nonlinear linearities in. So um, in in one D there's no problem. So in one D the Gaussian measure is essentially a variant of a Brownian bridge or a Brownian motion. And then this is just I mean you just write this down. You have a right. You interpret this. Uh, you then interpret this bit here without the quartic as uh, as as Brownian bridge or Brownian, Brownian motion, whatever boundary conditions you want. And then this is just, um, I mean, this you just put in the density, you write it down and you're done. You have, you have constructed the measure. In two dimensions, it's already a bit more tricky than that. And this was, I mean, this classically, that is classical that it works. So that's, that's done was done in the sixties because here you need to renormalize. So you have some counter terms, which again, uh, but, but the counter terms have the problem that they just destroy the fact that this five to the four is actually a non-negative term. And uh, so you, you have to work a bit to, to prove that this thing exists, but it's fine. And in three dimensions, it becomes even much harder. So in three dimensions, um, uh, again, this was this construction, this was solved by, by, by Glim and Jaffe and, and many people since the 70s. But here I've, I just got a reference for a very recent paper by, by Rashkov and Kubinelli that I will get to back later at the end of this talk. Um, and, um, and, and so one of the th issues, for example, that, that makes the construction three dimensions harder even is that the measure that you get in the limit is even singular with respect to the Gaussian free field. So you have no chance of writing down, proving that the density is integrable because it's not, okay? So I mean, it's just not, the measure exists, but it's not equivalent to the, to the Gaussian free field. And, you, um, and uh, so that makes your life already a lot harder. And also working this thing is, is, is harder because of that. And then, okay, I had already mentioned the, the triviality results in dimension four and higher, okay? So, so, so that's sort of the setup. That's the that's the measure that we wanted to work with. And what I want to do now is I want to go back to the connection with easing and elaborate on that a little bit more. And especially we're going towards um, this this question of uh, of phase transition also for five to the four measures. And um, so here I this is going back to easing. And I wanted to show you that there's actually a slightly if you want more more solid connection between easing type models and um, and and this part of the four models, so I had shown you on the second slide of the talk, I had showed you this formal derivation. Well, if you replace the Dirac by this double well thing, and if you replace the interaction by this H one norm, then it really looks like five to the four, and that's that's all fine. Um, but I, we can actually also just derive phi to the four as a um, as a scaling limit of, of of easing type models with long range interaction. And this is also again classical. So the, um, a, a relatively simple way of doing that was discovered already in the 70s by Griffith and Simon. And what they did is a sort of two scale limit. So they have a lattice where each lattice points are surrounded by, it's kind of a hierarchical lattice where every lattice point is surrounded by an infinite number of, of, of other lattice and they interact in a mean field way. And then only on the next level, they, they interact with the um, next lattice point. But here I want to discuss a, a, a perhaps more I mean, the description in another limit with the description of which is more recent, um, uh, which is this, this cuts, cuts type model. So what you can do is you can look at an easing model, which um, interpolates, if you want, between the nearest neighbor interaction and the mean field model where everything works, interacts with everything. So you can define such a Hamiltonian, which looks like, uh, like that. So you take some smooth, basically, it, let's think of this interaction, okay? So you basically take an indicator function for spins that are at dis, uh, a distance uh, closer than gamma inverse. So I've drawn this in my cartoon here. So you should think of this uh, spin here in the middle of my lattice that interacts with everything in this, uh, in this huge box and it, it interacts with the average of them. So that means that uh, if gamma is small, the interaction between two individual sites is very, very small. Um, uh, but it's still not a full mean field model because of course this spin does not interact with the spin out here. Okay, so that's, um, and, and then the bigger the box you make, the bigger you make the box, the more mean field you are, if you want, okay? And um, now if you look at this in the correct scale, and so what I've got here, so you, you zoom out in space, and the, the way the scaling works is the lattice is supposed to be much lesser than the interaction range, so that was this gamma inverse, which in turn has to be much less, much less than the macroscopic scale that you, um, that, you, that, you, that you choose to observe your system on. And then you also have to amplify your spin field in the right way. And then, 
to ne the next thing we have to do is to also tune the temperature in the right way. And this is interesting. So what you have to do here, you have your, your beta, you have to choose the, or the inverse temperature here. You have here the, the crit one corresponds to the critical value, for, I mean, the critical value that you would have if you really had only the mean field theory. And then you have to put corrections to that. And the corrections are small. So you see here, gamma is gamma goes to zero in the limit. And so you have here this, this small correction. Um, and okay, you have here the counter terms, which again, I'm going to brush under the rug as much as I can. But then you have a bit of freedom. You can put here an extra small constant. Um, and then what you do, if you go to this limit, and you actually recover, um, you recover this phi to the four theory. Um, and you have here this interaction, you have here this cortex, well, the prefactor is one over 12, but fine. But the thing which I want to stress is that you can actually tune here your, your prefactor of the, of the quadratic. So depending on what, if you choose to, I mean, right, the beta is the inverse temperature. So uh, if nu is positive, then you are a bit above this critical temperature. If nu is negative, you're a bit below the critical temperature. And you can, depending on how you zoom in, you can tune that to get here different, um, the, these different mass terms in the, in, the, in, the, in the measure. And so this, I mean, this again, this, this kind of uh, limit was studied in the 90s and I've got just a couple of references here by, by Cassandro Mara and Presutti. And there's a really beautiful survey article on, on lots of stuff like that by Giacomina Libovitz and Presutti from the late 90s. And then these more recent papers by, by, by jean Christophe and myself and, uh, and also Martin and his PhD student, uh, Massimo Udati. Um, one thing I want to still stress about this slide, which I kind of like, if you look at the exponents, uh, you see here, you can kind of pick up in the exponents that something goes wrong in four dimensions, right? So I told you before that this theory, you can really only do the constructed for dimension below four. And you sort of see this also nicely in the exponents that you have here that, uh, I mean, that don't make so much sense if, if, if the dimension goes to four. So it's, um, oh yeah, I think Stephen, your, your question yeah. is not, yeah. do you still have a yeah. question? Ah. Yeah, yeah, if I, if I could quickly. So when the V is negative, that's from a, the spin model standpoint, that's the phase separation regime. You have two distinct local minima. So could you sort of touch on the, because there's a broken symmetry there between those two cases. Could you touch on that in this context? That's the next 10 slides. Okay, sorry. <laughs> if you let me go to the next slide, then you, see, you will see that I'm going to talk about that now. Yeah, so exactly. So I completely agree. Thanks for the observation. Um, so sorry, do you still have a question or is this just the, the, okay. No, that's good. That's exactly the question. <laughs> but, but, but exactly. So yeah, that's the question. So I completely agree with you. Of course now, um, but that's sort of the point that I wanted to make is that depending on, uh, on how you choose that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that parameter here, indeed this, uh, this potential that I've drawn here starts to look very different. So you have, um, uh, you have either here a convex potential, which you should think of as the, I mean, that's happened, that, that, that happens for new positive. So this was the a bit above criticality case. And then you have this, uh, this uh, new negative, which was, the, which, was the, uh, the, the, which was, if you chose in your cuts approximation, just a little bit below criticality. And, uh, and you, I mean, you can kind of imagine that this, uh, I mean, this makes sense, right? So this is, uh, yeah, I mean, here, I mean, these kind of pictures for people who have seen, um, uh, anything on phase transitions for easing, I mean, that is the current reason I mean, that you get these double wells here that won't be so surprising. Um, I want to just, for once, I mean, there's always this counter term that I, um, that I, uh, that I uh, smuggle along and I put it in gray and I try to brush it under the rug as much as I possibly can. So I, I, the, the, the ugly truth is a slight bit more ugly than the nice pictures that I'm drawing here because these counter terms sort of are always an infinite, uh, you have an infinite mass term here still. And if you, well, okay, perhaps I'm just gonna ignore this thing just to, just to, to stress that I'm brushing something under the rug with that, but, uh, uh, but let, let's let's not be too worried about it. Okay, good. Um, so 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 that's the um, that's the that's the, the the picture. And so the question that that then makes sense is uh, is there? I mean, can we? I mean, so so this five to the four model still has the parameter which corresponds to the temperature. So this this renormalized mass here. And the question now is that um, that that we want to discuss is there. I mean, in, in easing, of course, everybody know, I mean, many of you will know that there's this different, distinct difference between this large and small temperature regime. And what we wanted to see here is, can we get something like that also for five to the four? 
And here, this is just um, a, a review on, on results for easing. So what is this um, difference between high and low temperature? So one of the classical things is, of course, that if you're in the high temperature regime, then if you look at the spin-spin correlation here, so that just the, uh, the, uh, the curve, then as you move the spins further and further apart, and this just goes to zero. So essentially, as the spins are, are, are far apart, they, they don't see each other anymore. They don't care anymore if you're plus here, down here, it doesn't matter for that spin so much anymore. Whereas um, uh, at low temperature for higher beta, you have this long range order where the spins uh, I mean, like to be aligned even on, on large distances. Um, but there's actually also, actually I have a picture. Let me go to the picture before. I mean, many of you will have seen pictures like that before. So this is corresponds to the low temperature regime here on the left where, where black, the black, I mean, you see that even over a large box, the spins like to, to stay with the same color, same, same color. And here you have the, the high temperature regime where, um, I mean, the spin here really doesn't care very much about the spin down here. So that's what's reflected in this long range order behavior. Um, but there's actually the, the starting point for us going add to that, because I told you we came kind of from the SPDE at this, is that there's actually a dynamic, um, a, a, a dynamic interpretation or I mean, um, expression, if you want, of this five phase transition behavior. So if you look at the global dynamics for, for easing, and you look at the mixing behavior of this global dynamics, then this is also a bit drastically different depending on if you're in the high or on the low temperature regime. So in the high temperature regime, you have, um, uh, uh, I mean, you have a spectral gap for the system. If you look at it in a large box of size L, so then the spectral gap of the system will actually stay bounded away from zero as you let the size of the box go to infinity. Um, whereas if you are in the low temperature regime, then the spectral gap of the system um, uh, decays exponentially with, uh, with, with this, uh, this, this, this decay in the size of the box. And then at criticality, you have um, actually very interesting, you have polynomial decay. And uh, there's something that, for example, this perfect work here by, by Lubezki and Sly from, from like eight, nine years ago, um, where this was discussed at length. But of course, this is all not very surprising. So if you've ever done a simulation of that, run a Monte, Monte Carlo simulation of that, then the fact that, for example, in the low temperature regime, you have, um, you have uh, this exponential decay of spectral gap just reflects to the, the, the fact that if you start your simulation here with, um, with such a black, such a black uh, uh, configuration, you're never ever going to see a white configuration, right? I mean, it's just, you have to wait for long. You just don't see this translate transaction, translate translation. And that's exactly what corresponds to here, this exponential decay. So the, this is, um, this, this corresponds to the fact that the system really, really doesn't want to move over from all black to all white. Okay. Yes, Stephen. So, sorry, just, to, so the uh, dimension D minus one, is that related to concentration on the interfacial energy? If you let me go to the next slide, oh, sorry. I'm very, I'm very pleased that my slides are so suggestive. <laughs> Thanks again, sorry. Absolutely, yes. Um, right, so sorry, it's not the next slide, it's the slide after, but I, I get to it, I promise. Um, yes, so... Um, uh, so, so the, what we're going, what we're going to look at is actually just a slight rescaling. So this is just a, to to get the notation. So I mean, we're now going to. This is not exactly the same parameterization with uh, uh, that we had before with this cut easing. I'm just going to be introduce. We we rescale the field, but it's, it's almost the same. So we look at at, the, at this at this um, at this um, uh, this way of parameterizing our potential. And now just to say that this beta is not the same beta that we had before, but it's related. And uh, so, the, but the picture is, is exactly the same, is that we have this double well picture, double well, um, this double well here with a minima as at a plus minus square root of beta and a potential barrier here between them of height, of height beta. And of course the intuition now for us, so we, sorry, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be in the low temperature regime. So in this, uh, that's the main point of, of this talk uh, to, to establish such a decay of spectral gap and I'll get to that. So, so we're going to implement that um, now by, by looking at such a double well. So this is just a rescaling of the thing before. Uh, we have here, um, yeah, square, square root of beta, uh, these double wells at, at, at the minima at plus minus square root of beta, the potential barrier here of height beta. And uh, of course, the, the idea now is that if, if, if a, it's a transition from here to here, so if you want to have a field which has, it has values here and uh, values there elsewhere, then this will cost you more in this gradient term. So that's why it becomes unlikely. And the bigger the beta, the bigger the cost for that will be. 
And um, so, so there, there are actually, I mean, let me also give, give justice to, to these classical results so that, that the, the established phase transition for 5.4 has been established. And on the level of long range order, so there's again, these works from the seventies. Um, and here's just, I mean, I've, I've given you here just how the statement actually looks like in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in B equal to two. So exactly beta large with exactly this parameterization that I've shown you in the previous slide. Then the result that was proved in this work by Glim, Jaffe, and Spencer is that um, if you look, so I'm going to define now these local averages of, um, of, uh, of a field. So I fix a box, uh, well, it's such a quadratic box here, quadratic box. And the observable that I look at is this average of the field over the box. And what they proved, for example, is this long range order fact that. Uh, that's kind of, if you look at a large, the, the average over this box and the, the average over this box, then they, then they don't forget about each other. So they want to be, they want to be the same, even if they are very far apart. So this is uh, what this formula here says. So the, I mean, the probability here that this box is bigger than, than zero is of course a half. The probability that this one is, is bigger than zero is, is a half, but um, the probability that they are, um, that they are different is going to be very, very small if beta is large enough. Okay, so that's uh, that's what the um, actually sorry I think I should have put absolute values perhaps around that because I think this is going to be yeah I think this this is only true if you put absolute values around it sorry um, so so but the, the point of this result is of course that the boxes uh, that are uh, far apart they they still see each other and um, so what we proved is now now a three dimensional result. That's the main result of this, this whole story is, is um, actually something stronger. And that's actually, basically, I, I hope it's the answer to, to Stephen's question, which is, um, uh, so what we proved is in 3D, you look at this measure, again, for beta large enough. Um, and we look now at the measure on a torus of size N, not dyadic, but okay, but large enough. Um, and so what we prove is that the probability that the uh, this this average or so the, the the mean magnetization if you want so the the average over the field over this whole box that this is um is, is small so what you should think of here is this this double well shape that that you see here at the bottom and what this event here is is i have here a plot in green this if you want this forbidden region and so what we're bounding is the probability um that uh uh, that you are in this forbidden region. And what we're saying is that this decays um, exponentially and it decays exponentially exactly with this n squared, or with this n squared. And that's, um, so, so, so that's in a sense, our, that's our main result. Um, yeah, uh, so perhaps let me just go back. And I think that's really, that's, that this slide is now really uh, the idea that addresses the, uh, the, the, the question that Stephen asked. So this is just at the top here is just copied from what we had, um, from what I had on the previous slide. And the picture that you should have in mind with that is that how can such a configuration actually, I mean, what configuration could you actually have that has total magnetization close, I mean, it has average close to zero. So if you think about this double well picture, then your spins like to be locally either plus square root of beta or minus square root of beta. And if you kind of believe that, then the uh, only way that you can achieve um, that you can achieve or total magnetization close to zero would be that um, would be that well you would have to have such an island a big island here of roughly the uh, volume of, of uh, half of the volume where it should be uh, should be minus minus square root of beta and then you should have another bit of the you should have another bit of the of your plate where you're clo close to plus beta and and of course if you want to have total magnetization close to zero then you would have to have that both of them have close to the same area. And then by isoparametric inequality, then this uh, implies that the uh, interface between these at least has to be of size n squared, right? So if the, if the total box, this is three, a three-dimensional picture, which I mean, you cannot appreciate from a picture, but it's a three-dimensional three dimension. So if you want to have um, an island of volume at least uh, I mean, n cubed, then the interface has to have at least n squared. And this, this two here is of course exactly a d minus one. So I think I just erased the one. Um, and again, for the easing model, uh, similar results uh, are known for, for a while. So in, in 2D, this was, for example, proved by Schoenmann in, in, in the 80s and then by Pistora in, in the 90s. 
And so we are now proving this in this much more singular uh, situation with pi, pi, pi to the four. And um, just to, to, go, go, to go further, so that, um, that, that gives us immediately um, the, uh, the, the, the analog of the, um, in the easing model, if you remember a couple of slides ago, I had showed you uh, that you have this breakdown of ergodicity. So if you start with the black configuration, you're never gonna see the white configuration and, this, uh, and, and, uh, and, and you, um, you see this in the decay of the spectral gap. And uh, so here for 5.4, you have exactly the same. So you have, um, uh, so this is exactly the same kind of, the same kind of picture. And this is really an immediate, very easy corollary from our um, large deviation bound on the mean magnetization. You just, you, I mean, you, you plug in just the right, right, right test function into the Dirichlet form. And what you just plug in is such an indicator function, which only takes in the magnetization of your field. So this is really a, a three line proof of the, um, uh, once you have the, uh, the um, this large deviation bound. Okay. So, um, so that's the, that's the, the main result uh, of, this, um, of, of this paper. And I want to now, yes. Um, so I want to actually spend the last, uh, I think I have 12 minutes or so um, to show you our main technical tools. So Trish is going to show you sort of the, the ugly truth as I had already told you. So how do you actually uh, go about proving something like that? But I want to just spend 10 minutes to introduce one really, really key tool um, that we, that we I mean, I've already mentioned this, this very nice work by Varashkov and Rubinelli, and I want to now spend the last 10 minutes of this lecture to, to explain that because this was really technically the, the thing that, that, that gave us access to, to things like that. What is crossed integral? Oh yes, sorry, um, crossed integral is, uh, uh, sorry, this is a convention that I use. So integral cross over set A is by definition the integral over A over the area of A. So this is just the average over the set A. Is that okay? Try. I, I, yes, yes, okay, yes, okay, okay. Sorry, this is a, sorry, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't explain that convention. Um, okay, so the, the, last, uh, the last 10 minutes, I'm going to explain um, that there's this thing by, by Barashkov and Gubinelli a little bit. Um, uh, so T Trish will tell you in a minute that, that the way we access something like that, it, it comes down to actually calculating exp expectations of things under that, um, under, that uh, uh, under, under, this, uh, under this measure, right? So we have this measure new, which is this non-Gaussian measure, and we want to actually calculate expectations of things. And in particular, you can, we can tweak our thing that we have to calculate expectations of exponentials. So in the end of the day, it really amounts to proving things like generalized partition functions. So um, uh, I mean, exponential integrals, if you want, of a Gaussian, okay? And so, so, so this is, of course, a very classical topic and um, uh, in, in the, and actually all the classical constructions to, to phi to the five, phi to the four models rely on, on, on cal calculating this in one way or another. And uh, so in the two dimensional case, there's this nice Nelson, this classical Nelson trick that, that does this for you. And in three dimensions, there were also techniques that were introduced for them, which are significantly, what is QI? Oh, uh, QI is a suitable observable, which Trish will tell you about what it is in a minute. Thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry. I, for, 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 for me, actually, in a minute, I'm going to choose QI to be zero, and I'm just going to show you how to calculate uh, just the partition function without generalizing it. Um, but so, so for, for, for intervals of this type, there are these techniques by, by, by uh, I mean, Glim Jaffe's and Spencer's work, uh, sorry, Glim, Jaffe, Glim Jaffe's work essentially gave, them, gave means to calculate things like that. And then since then, uh, other methods in particular based on, on renormalization group, rigorous implementations of Wilson's renormalization group, have been um, have been implemented for this. Um, I find them a little bit hard to work with. I mean, certainly I found what what, what we, we could work with hard easier, but that's possibly also more more due to um, due to my background. Um, perhaps I want to just stress also that these stochastic PDE tricks. I mean, there has been of course this enormous body of work for in the last years on stochastic PDEs. Um, uh, but actually, these stochastic PDEs don't really help you so much in calculating these partition functions. And that's a bit similar to what you do when you do a Monte Carlo simulation for your Gibbs measure. Sort of, if you want, one of the features of your Monte Carlo of the Markov chain is that you don't have to know the partition function, that you just, uh, 
you just have the logarithmic derivative. You don't need to calculate the z itself. Uh, but at the same time, it also doesn't give you much access to the z. So, uh, so it's kind of the first thing you observe when you when you come from stochastic PDE that they don't really help you kind of calculating these partition functions. Uh, but then, uh, then it turns out that that due to due to this this really fantastic work by 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 by, by these two. Actually, I think I learned that uh, Nikolai Barashkov, he, he was a student with Massimiliano on this part of his thesis, and I think he defended it today, I think. So if he's, if he's here, congratulations. But um, so, uh, so, so, so this technique still has an, has an analysis flavor, and, uh, and we use this a lot in here. And I'm going to explain this to you a tiny bit. So this is, um, this is based on, on actually a classical, um, Classic uh, uh, result you to to go into pre go into pre formula and this is the this is the statement. So it says that if you have a standard R D valued Brownian motion or if you want complex valued, and you have some observable which is allowed to depend on the whole trajectory of your um, of your Brownian path, uh, say real valued and let's say for simplicity bounded measurable, um, then you have this very explicit formula for. Um, for for these exponential uh, for these exponential intervals, so you have uh, uh, you have a Gaussian a Gaussian expectation. You have your of your observable in the exponent, and you have this variational representation. So you can actually um, represent this this uh, expectation that you want to calculate as the solution of a variational problem. And I mean, let me perhaps just state that this is really just a variant of the Gibbs variation. I mean, it's very close, at least in spirit, to the Gibbs variational principle, which just tells you actually in, in huge generality that if you have such a if you have such an exponential integral here for some measure p, then then you can then you can always do, do this trick where you that you just move the exponent outside if you're willing to pay this relative en relative, ent relative entropy term here. Uh, so you take the the you you remove the x outside by moving to another equivalent measure here and then paying the relative entropy for it. Um, and the, but the nice thing about the Brownian framework is that, I think I have this on the next slide actually. Oh, no, I don't, sorry, I have it here. So the, the nice thing about the Brownian framework, why this is so nice, is that a Wiener measure has very rigid structure. So Wiener measure, we know explicitly what all the invariant measures are. That's due to Gersanov theorem, right? We know that all equivalent measures to Wiener measure are actually a um, just shifts of Brownian motion, and the shifts uh, are given by Gersanov formula. So that's the statement, and so 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 that that's how this relates. So we, it, 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 we I mean right I mean any measure that is equivalent to Wiener measure the, the, that can be given as a shift of a Brownian motion, and then the relative entropy in this case actually has a very easy expression just as this a two norm of the of the uh, of the drift. Okay, so that's um, that's 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 very nice. So the in, in a sense, it's it's really the Gibbs variation of principle. But in the case of Wiener, Wiener measure, we have a very explicit handle on what these equivalent measures actually look like. Okay. Um, so now, why is this useful for us? I mean, really, this is this is really the the, the useful added bonus as opposed to the the Gibbs variation of principles. Of course, this time dependency, the fact that we have Gersanov theorem, that we have this rigid structure of Wiener space that gives us explicit uh, control on, on all these equivalent measures. Um, but of course, we don't have Brownian motion. I mean, we have this Gaussian measure, but it's, um, but it's not a Brownian motion. So what, what does it help us? And the thing that the trick is now that, and that I think was really the, 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 the key insight here in this paper is that we don't have a Brownian motion, but we have a Gaussian measure. So we can always just pretend we have a time dependence. So we, we, we don't a priori have a time dependence at all. But we can just say our Gaussian random distribution, Gaussian random, Gaussian random variable, is the law of some Brownian motion at time one. Okay, I mean, why not? I mean, why to just replace the standard normal by a Brownian motion at time one? You can always do that. So this this time a priori has no physical meaning, but it still gives us extremely good handle in the analysis. So what you what you now do is you you want to calculate expectation of a, with respect to a Gaussian measure here, and the Gaussian measure has here this covariance operator. Um, and so what you, what, what, what you do is you introduce, if you want a function valued Brownian motion, where this is the variable that you really care about, that's the real physical variable, this T variable doesn't mean anything really, um, but it's, it's this algorithmic variable for, to be able to, to use Boer Dupuy, uh, to use Gersanov theorem that we know the equivalent measures. And, and the, the, the only thing we have to, have to ensure is that the law at say time one, or I think in their notation they use time infinity, but okay, so the, the law at time one should be equal to the, the measure that we want. 
And in our case, that's actually easy to do. You can, again, I told you that the measure itself, samples from the Gaussian measure itself can be written down by a random Fourier series. So I've done that here again. And the only thing that I've now changed with respect to the, um, to the slide at the beginning is that originally I had here IID Gaussian random variables. And now I've just replaced each of these standard normals by a Brownian motion. And at time one, the standard Brownian motion is a standard normal. Okay, so the interpolation is, is not so super com complicated. Let me perhaps also just say that I'm lying a little bit here because in, in, in the actual work in 3D, one has to be a little bit more careful and do a slightly more sophisticated uh, uh, version of this, um, of this, of this, uh, uh, but okay, uh, again, let me, let me ignore that. So, so now we have, ha have this, and now we can just use the, the Bois de Puy formula, um, or the two in, in this case, and now we want, so for, for reasonable functional age, all our functions are reasonable, uh, you want to calculate this expression here. And now we're just going to use the fact that, um, that our Brownian motion that we have just constructed on the previous slide has the correct law at time one. So then by definition, that's equal to this expectation with the Brownian motion at time one. But now we can use the Bois de Puy formula with this auxiliary algorithmic time. And, um, and now we can write these uh, exponent Gaussian exponential expressions with this variational formula. And again, I mean, so this was, this was this paper by by Rubinelli, and they they used it to to prove this ultraviolet stability of 543. So basically, giving good estimates on the partition function for 543. And as Trish will tell you in the second talk, a large part of our work consisted of um, of getting better bounds. I mean, in the specific case with this non-convexity on um, on uh, on our partition function. So uh, just to as a very last thing uh, to show you how this then works, I have actually here one slide very quickly to just give you a spirit of how they construct, how this works, for example, as a construction of 542. So in 542, you just want to, um, for example, calculate this partition function. So you want to prove that this thing here is, um, is, 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 bounded, is bounded. So you want to prove an upper bound on this partition function, which amounts to proving a lower bound on minus the log of the partition function, which means you have to get a lower bound on this infimum here. And now you just plug it in. So here, this was the Gaussian. You have here this wick square, so you can, uh, can, can kind of unwick it. So you just expand in powers of V. And then what you see is, so you want to get a lower bound on this big expression here. And uh, uh, so now let's have a look. So these terms that I've put here in red, they're actually non-negative and are, those are our good terms. And uh, then we have here this thing that actually happens to have expectation zero, so we're not worried. And then you have here these cross terms. And now the proof proving that this thing is, is bounded from below actually only amounts, reduces to a harmonic analysis problem. So it really reduces to proving uh, or an analysis problem to getting a lower bound on or getting a bound on these cross terms in terms of the good terms. So it's really like a, you know, this kind of question, can you bound this norm of this term by this norm of this term? And it's, it really reduces the thing to analysis, which uh, I, mean, I find quite appealing. Others may not find so appealing, but uh, yeah. And uh, just to say, I mean, that the, the analysis is very close in spirit to then actually what is done in this, this para control calculus. So I think I'm, I'm pretty much at the end of what I wanted to tell you. And I'll hand over to Trish in a few minutes. I just have just a, a quick recap of, um, of where we were here. And I think pick, Trish will pick up here from, from here in, in 15 minutes. So I hope I've convinced you that these five to the four theories are interesting and they arise really in various contexts in mathematical physics. And um, there's this difficulty of dealing with very low, low regularity and renormalization that I've again tried to emphasize as little as possible, possible but it's, it's, it's the thing you fight against in this theory of business. And so what we were looking at is this, this low temperature regime and we, we obtain this large deviation bound for a typical, a typically small magnetization. And we get the correct surface orders uh, scaling in, in the size of our box. And we get from that a, a decay of spectral gap and then with the right order in, in L. And uh, in the last minutes, I, I told you about this key technical tool, which is this Barashko Kobinelli variational approach to this ultraviolet stability. And uh, so this is where I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a lovely talk. So what I'll do I'll now, I'll just invite the audience to unmute themselves, uh, and then we can give Hendrik a round of applause. <laughs> So if anyone has any questions, um, again, there's two ways you can ask your questions. So either you can uh, type it in the chat 
Um, or if you raise your hand, um, I can invite you to uh, to speak. So Stephen, looks like you have a, a question. No, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let others jump in. Ah, Alessandra. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so uh, you may, so you have this uh, surface order bounds, uh, and you mentioned similar results for the Eason model. So since your model is also a, can be thought also as the limit of the CAS model, are there similar results also for the CAS model? Um, uh, Trish, I think uh, Trish would say yes. So yeah, I would say yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So I have a, a, a naive question. So um, a very basic question. So at the end, you mentioned the ultraviolet stability. But uh, what do you mean? C can you repeat um, uh, what you mean that uh, this uh, logarithm is uh, uniformly bounded uh, in the in the size n? So um, no, okay. So wait, so so the, okay. This was a bit yeah, jargon, which I didn't explain. Sorry. So this ultraviolet. So this is something that I've. I mean, all of what I've been speaking about. Uh, I've tried to put the emphasis on the problem. You're in a large box. You want to get the right behavior in L. But sort of the technical difficulty in, in working with all of that is actually to um, to let the lattice size go to zero. That's uh, that is. Um, I've mentioned that at the beginning. You have this renormalization. You have these. You have these. Uh, you have these counter terms, and you work with this in this very low regularity class. And ultraviolet ref refers to the limit as you remove that epsilon going to zero. So as you go to smaller and smaller scales, which. Um, um, yeah, so the, the that's what it refers to, and it's something that I've tried to brush under the rug as, as much as possible. But it's really, I mean, this is sort of the, the first thing you have to solve before you can do the second thing, which what which we, which is what we did. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Are there other questions? Uh, Stephen, you have one now. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful talk, Heinrich. Loved it. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah, this this question is perhaps uh, orthogonal but you were making these interesting links to the Glauber dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you've looked at the conservative version, the Kawasaki dynamics, where it's spin exchange rather than just spin flip. Um, well, I mean, on which level? So on the level of the particle and uh, the cuts approximation, it's a very difficult, it's much more difficult than doing, doing Glauber. Um, um, yeah, I, I guess I guess I, I was kind of interested in. I, mean, I haven't thought of this well now, but I was interested in sort of what distinguishing features are there at the critical point based on the uh, the mechanisms of exchange, whether the critical behavior for the conservative case is qualitatively different, and then of course that links also to this other question about the dynamics. Mm -hmm. um... I think it's a very interesting question, but I'm not sure if I can say something very intelligent. To well, neither can I. I just thought it was fun to just throw it out there. I mean, I like the spectrum of everything you've said, and I just sort of find myself wanting to maybe map out in my own mind how that would play out in the conservative case, um, even even if it's even if it's not known, but just simply the sort of the, the links between all these viewpoints. I mean, the thing is, I don't know, which is a very different statement from "it's not known," right? Uh, um, I guess the mechanism would be quite different, right? Because if you want to go, say, in this, in the, if you want in the Glauber dynamics, if you want to go from a so black to all white, you have to basically create a nucleus in the middle, and then. No, but wait, sorry, sorry. The uh, so, the, so with the, the Kawasaki, you have an invariant phase you fraction. You have an invariant phase fraction. So then, in fact, there's a submanifold of behaviors there. Right, right, right. Uh, Anyway, just, just a thought. I was just curious if you had uh, considered it. I don't think I have something very intelligent to say. I'm sorry. No worries. It was, it was a great talk. Loved it. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions that people would like to ask? Hi. So can you go to page 10? Mm. Excuse me? Thank yes, you. I'll find my slides again. Sorry. I think I had my, my, my iPad has stopped sharing, but yes. Yeah, thank you. Give me a second. Okay. Why did it take a second? Okay, good. So slide 10, you said. 
10 is, yes, I'm going to slide 10. Yeah, page 10. Oh, page, Sorry, page, yeah. page 10, is that the page 10 or is that the? Uh, yeah, just this page, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so I'm wondering when the new is inactive. So in, in quantum field theory, this means that you have an imag uh, imaginative mass, right? Yes. Yeah, so that, what does this mean in this context? Imaginative mass, I mean. Hmm? I, I think uh, it just, yeah. Okay, I mean, now I'm, I'm getting, going on dangerous terrain, but I think it just means you don't have mass. But I mean, normally, if you have a if you have a mass if you have a mass, then you would have to have exponential decay of correlations, and that that's basically what the mass gives you. And and so here you don't have that. But possibly. Okay, so is there some physical hmm? physical part? Uh, uh, is there some physical illustration for this? Physical. physical. Wait, a, the, I think uh, it's probably if you want to do it from the quantum field theory perspective. It's obtained from scaling transformations from a lambda phi four theory where lambda is very large, and then you don't have a negative mass. But because you have renormalization, you effectively have an infinitely convex potential at any scale. Well, at, at uh, when you take the ultraviolet limit, so it's just it's just a convenient scaling for us. And because we are, or because uh, at least I prefer the statistical mechanics convention, that's why we use this. But Trish, I think the question was about: Is there what's the what's the I mean, in 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 uh, we have this. The mass is defined to be the exponential decay of correlations, right? Or the square root of that, or something. Um, and uh, so here, you don't you. I mean, you just don't have exponential decay of correlations. So I think it just means you don't have a mass. You mean mass zero. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any last questions before we we break? I had a question, uh, sorry. Um, I think I, I got a bit confused between the few models. Uh, your, your result is in the continuum limit, right? Yes. Or the model in the limit. Yes. Could you say um, what are the lattice models that tend to this limit? Um, is, there, um, is it easy to say uh, what would you put in the lattice that tends to the model that you analyze? You said that you're also hiding a few things under the rug, but... Um, no, but didn't I, I mean, I thought I said that. So, uh, I mean, what you can do for this continuum model, what you can do is you can do this cuts interaction, for example. So you take an uh -huh. easy model with this uh, long range interaction where you, you put yourself in a scaling where you have uh, this, 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 la the, this mesoscopic scale of the interaction range, which is much bigger right. than the size and much bigger, much smaller right. than the macro size. And if you pass to the limit in, 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 in this level, you get the continuum. Uh, okay, but let me ask you, can you also do it on the lattice level with uh, real valued spins and uh, not easing spins? So uh, to get, uh, you know, basically the Hamiltonian that's written at the bottom of your slide, but on the lattice level and have that converge to the model that you're studying? Oh yeah, that's easier. Yeah, okay. And then I wanted to understand, um, on the lattice level, uh, can you use Peyer's type arguments? Because if, if indeed you have this double well type potential, then you should be very unlikely maybe by reflection. Um, I think you should wait for the next okay. talk because that's, that's, that, that is actually what we do. And, and doesn't it come out of reflection positivity just that the chance to be at the point of high energy is very unlikely at every vertex and with the multiplicative bound by the chessboard estimate? We use chessboard estimates also, but it's still not so easy in this local local. It's uh, not in office, so I will see. All right, thanks so much. <laughs> okay, I think we should probably pause now um, and take a, a, a short break and just so everyone can get a cup of coffee. And uh, we'll restart again at, um, at five past with the, the second talk. But uh, in the meantime, I'll just uh, once more invite everyone to unmute themselves and thank Hendrik um, again. <laughs> So Hendrik, if you could unshare your slide and then um, Trish can, can take over. That. All right, so I'll actually leave with my iPad. Okay. Perfect. So Trisha, do you want to share? Okay, perfect. Okay. Maybe you can enlarge a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. No, I think it was better before for me, actually. Um, 
That's better? Yeah, that, for me, that looks good. Um, what's it like for you, Alessandra? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, okay. I, I have to say I have a big uh, computer in my office and also the laptop, I see reasonably. Okay, the laptop is uh, smaller, but okay, maybe if uh, some person has problem, somebody could tell us. Yeah, I mean, in any case, I'll zoom in like this during the presentation. No, 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 but uh, okay, for the moment, leave uh, not things uh, like now, I think. Okay, cool. I'll just be back in, in uh, five minutes or three minutes. Uh, yes, <laughs> three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. So I, I will uh, make an announcement anyway. Okay, a short announcement. Okay, good. Trisha, I see well, don't, don't worry. Uh, it's because I had the participants, a chat, everything. Open. Ah, okay. Uh, the size is, uh, is okay. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. So I think it's time to restart. The first, uh, an announcement, short announcement. Uh, so this is the last uh, uh, One World Probability Seminar before the Eastern break. Uh, after uh, the, the Eastern break, uh, there will be two new moderators, so Julien Beresicki and Nina Ganter, and uh, uh, probably, okay, the, the One World Probability Seminar, seminar sh should start again on April 15, with the talks of Peter Murters and Marcus Heide Heidenreich. Anyway, uh, pay attention to the um, uh, mails. You will uh, get uh, updates uh, directly from uh, Nina and Julien. So it's a pleasure now to have um, here uh, uh, Trishen Gunaratman uh, working now in uh, Geneva, and he will continue uh, talking about the phase transitions for the uh, for the uh, three four three models. Okay, thank you, and and thanks for inviting uh, both me and Hendrik. So, so I'm going to carry on uh, from uh, Hendrik on discussing this joint work with AJ and Hendrik. Uh, on phase transitions. So uh, just in case you forgot something, uh, uh, making coffee, let me just recap things for you. So, so the model we're interested in is a specific scaling of the 543 model, uh, where we take as our potential a double well with minima plus and minus square root beta and a potential barrier of height beta. Uh, and then, okay, a massless Gaussian measure as reference measure. Okay, this doesn't make sense as Hendrik said, uh, and we will go into the detail of that later. Um, but if you just look at this uh, and, and you uh, 
you, you imagine beta going to infinity, then you can see uh, that, that this model starts to resemble low temperature easing. In particular, if you kind of view uh, this, uh, you absorb it into the reference measure, so you pretend you're in a lattice, then your spins are going to concentrate at these two things, and by a, a, a scaling, you can see that you get easing, essentially. So a very natural question is, does, does the model undergo phase transition? Uh, and and the, the answer is yes. So there's long range ordering uh, for sufficiently low temperatures. And in 2D, this is uh, a classical work by Glim, Jaffe, and Spencer uh, via modification of Pyle's argument, as, uh, Ron, uh, as Ron suggested. Um, uh, and in 3D, uh, there, there is a, 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 a very different argument based on infrared bounds and reflection positivity, uh, which, is, which is more powerful in the sense that it can deal with uh, systems of continuous symmetry. So, you know, you, you kind of make a wine bottle out of this or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's less quantitative for the questions that we're interest, interested in. So these large deviations of the magnetization. Um, but OK, the, the Pyle's theory of uh, this extends to 3D and uh, Kind of the uh, there's a question. Oh, okay. Link. Uh, it's yeah. the link to your slides. Okay. Yeah. No worries. So um, uh, right, and uh, you know, we, we really wanted to use a, a Pyle's theory to address this question, and uh, th there was a, a, a gap which I'm going to talk about in jumping from 2D to 3D that comes from the fact that you have to deal with both issues at the large scale and at the small scale, and somehow deal with them at the same time. Okay, so so anyway, uh, you know what our motivation was: uh, can we say any quant anything quantitative about this uh, low temperature regime? And our main result is uh, is is pretty easy to state. So we look at the average magnetization, so that's the uh, the normalized integral of of the field uh, over the whole torus. And here, Tn is a, a three dimensional torus of side length n, where n is dyadic, whatever. And then um, our main result says that if you look at the, the average magnetization being in some corridor around zero, uh, this corridor kind of being the, the width being parameterized by square root beta, then this decays with a surface order decay. Um, yeah, an n squared uh, decay. So, so this is the correct scaling from, from a statistical mechanics point of view, this, this uh, surface order. Sorry, I can hear. Uh, uh, something, yeah, uh, it, it's surface order scaling um, because it, 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 in a sense, uh, indicates the, the, the presence of, of some sort of phase segregation result. So the, the, there are weak forms of phase segregations due to Schoenman and, and, uh, and Pistora for 2D and 3D in the 80s and 90s. Um, uh, but for the easing model, there are much more uh, subtle and, uh, I guess, uh, more powerful statements. Uh, Beginning with the work of Minlos and Sinai, and then uh, culminating in Wolf constructions in the in the early '90s and and uh, and uh, at the end of the millennium. Um, so 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 that's the the kind of main interest is is this surface order scaling. But there's also something else which is interesting, in, in at least uh, for me, is is that uh, we get uh, uh, I think the correct lord uh, correct leading order beta dependence in both the the dependencies on the set here and also here. So. So uh, this has to do with two things. So, so one that uh, here, this, this, you know, this MN is clearly related in some, this, this event is clearly related to the spontaneous magnetization and to leading order, the spontaneous magnetization is square root beta. So it's not surprising that we see a corridor of width square root beta and the fact that we can actually go, we can replace a half here by something strictly less than one, because essentially what we're saying is we, you know, if you make the temperature high enough, we're going into the forbidden region kind of away from the spontaneous magnetization. Now, the second, uh, the, the second thing about the beta dependence is here. So this is, this is interesting. So, you know, uh, and I'm going to come back to this at the, yeah, yes, Stephen? Yeah, just quickly, since you're mentioning this uh, link, the constant C that appears there, what's your interpretation for that constant? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, in the post credit scene of this talk, uh, I'll discuss uh, uh, what I think should be there, and it's related to the rate function of the magnetization. Uh, and for the easing case, it, this has links with the wolf shape. And for yeah, I was five thinking four, surface tension. Right, exactly. And for phi four, it's not really clear, uh, you know, what's what's going to happen. I, mean, I think it's a very interesting question. Thanks a lot. Okay, no worries. So so uh, right. Okay, and then the, the other thing uh, which Hendrik mentioned is that this result immediately implies uh, a, a decay of the spectral gap for the, for the Glauber dynamics, the 5, 4, 3 singular stochastic PDE. 
And uh, okay, it works in, in 2D and 3D. In 2D, you replace n squared by n everywhere. It's just surface order. Um, and uh, this was the original question that you know we came to this problem with in mind. Uh, and uh, at least for me, uh, this this turned out to be the more interesting question. So so you know both. If you want, you can restate the theorem as this, and this is the main tool to proving it. If you are more SPD inclined. Okay. So so I hope everyone now is is uh, knows the main result. It's it's a quantitative form of, of phase transition because it's telling you, in a sense, what the phases are doing, what, how the phases are. are uh, are segregating at low temperatures when you constrain them to be roughly the same number. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so how do we prove it? So, so Ron uh, was, uh, you know, he, he, he essentially predicted the talk by saying that we need a piles estimate, but you see that uh, it's not obvious that how one is gonna get a piles estimate for this model because it's a continuum model, first of all, uh, and the fields are, 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 are singular, so they, so if you remember that phi is, dish, is, is going to be, at least for the Gaussian, in some uh, Bezov space of C minus a half minus. So it's a distribution and it's, it's pretty irregular, it's way more regular than in 2D. Uh, so it's already not clear whether you can, you know, how, you know, how you block average if you want to use chessboard estimates. But Let's go to step zero or step minus one, which I realized I've forgotten added onto this little appendix that, okay. So our, our, our first step is we just coarse grain the torus into blocks, not coarse grain. We, we, we split the torus into unit blocks and we, um, we consider the block average field. So that's uh, the field of a uh, five box where, where five box is just, you take your distribution and you test it against the indicator of the sharp indicator function of a box. Now, the analysts among you might be getting a bit nervous uh, doing this, and I think that's fair. However, uh, deterministically, this is actually going to make sense because uh, this is a C minus one half uh, minus thing, and you can always test that against indicator functions of boxes. What's perhaps a bit more scary is that we also test the Wick squared field against the box. And this, and this is, is certainly not classically well defined. But, the, but you can define this probabilistically by essentially exploiting uh, kind of modern perspectives of how the phi is. So from a regularity perspective, phi is going to be something, the, the irregularities of phi are going to be captured in something Gaussian, and then the, uh, the kind of the rest is captured in a function. So I'm not going to say what the V is, but we'll come back to it. And the same for the Wick squared. This is going to be something which is a functional of a Gaussian plus something which is less less scary. So, so okay, step zero, which I forgot about, but which I think is important uh, for Ron's comment, is that we want to do we want to do Piles argument, but already it's not clear how you get a statistical mechanics system from this uh, very singular continuum field. Uh, how and particularly you want to use reflection positivity chessboard estimates, so you want to test against sharp indicator functions. So the first step is actually proving that you can do that. Okay. So so once we have that, we can uh, you know we we can essentially forget about all the small scale divergences uh, by looking at these these terms. Uh, and by forget about, I mean we have some strong moment bounds which allow us to forget about it. Then uh, the, the the kind of the, the first step in the proof is to establish a power's estimate on the occurrence of of uh, the, analog, the, the analog of contours for us. So, so we call them defects and let me tell you what they are. So, so defects are, uh, I'm gonna define them uh, as, as uh, let, me, let me tell you what aren't defects first and then the, everything, that's not a def everything that's not not a defect is a defect. So uh, we, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, zoom in on each cube and look at all of its star neighbors. And then we're going to check whether this, where, where the, uh, so, so yeah, you pick this cube here and you, you, you blow up its star, its star neighborhood. So that's all boxes which are either nearest neighbors or next nearest neighbors. And then you check where the uh, field is localized. So you look at the value of phi of box and you want to check where it is localized on the well. So, so we're going to say that a, a box is going to be good. So it's going to be plus good, that's this dark blue here if all the boxes in its star neighborhood are going to be localized in the plus well. 
And uh, we're going to say it's, go it's going to be um, minus good if all of the boxes in the star neighborhood are going to be uh, uh, localized in the minus well. And so our, our defects are going to consist of bad boxes where a box is bad if it's neither plus good or, 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 or minus good. Okay, so I'll let you think as an exercise, uh, which I'll, I'll tell you about in, in a few minutes of what it means to be bad, but you can already see that, uh, let me draw the exercise. I mean, you can already see that, how can this be, if it's neither plus, plus good or minus good, then either there's gonna be something which is localized in these regions of the well, or everything is localized, but you know, in one of the star neighborhoods, you see a plus and a minus. So I'll come back to that soon, but uh, just, just to spoil the story a bit. Okay, so now, now th these, uh, these defects are kind of analogs of these contours for us. Um, if, you, if you really think about it, like the fact that we, uh, we have this uh, star neighborhood condition is just geometric convenience. But if you really think about it, the, the fundamental thing is localizing the plus and minus wells. And then the, the, the contours come as, uh, as interfaces between plus and minus, or when we're not like easing, okay? Um, and the powers estimate for us tells us that if you take a collection of these bad boxes, then, uh, so you, you, you look at configurations. Uh, so yeah, you fix, you fix a, a collection of bad boxes and you look at uh, fields such that their block average configuration has this, uh, has this set of bad boxes then uh, the probability that this occurs decays exponentially uh, in the number of these bad boxes. And, and there's, a, there's a prefactor um, uh, of square root beta. And here the square root beta is, uh, is uh, somewhat sharp, at least the leading order, because that, that's the, uh, if, if you remember the double well here, the, 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 the cost to transition from plus to minus is going to cost you order square root beta. Okay, so 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 uh, so Ron, I hope that answers your question. That yes, we do have a powers estimate. That's the step zero in this whole thing. But the thing is that you, in order to establish this, you need you need to be able to say, ah, I can coarse grain, and I can uh, forget about the fact that I have a, a, con a singular continuum field. So that requires that requires one for these to be defined, and two for us to be able to control certain observables of these of these uh, of these random variables, which we'll see next in the next page. And if I may ask, uh, and uh, you cannot uh, derive these estimates from uh, first deriving them on the lattice level before you took the continuum limit and then uh, um, deducing that they um, remain true in the limit? Uh, you have to then control the ultraviolet divergences in the, in the limit for the lattice model. Uh, uh -huh. and, sorry? Yes, okay, uh -huh. yes. And, uh, and for that, um, I mean, we, so this, this method, this variational method, at least now, no one has done, has no one worked, has worked out on the lattice. Uh, if you manage to work out on the lattice, you would have to then combine what we do with, the lat with, uh, with this and sew them together. And maybe that is a little bit easier, but you still have the problem of competing non-convexity on large scales with the ultraviolet limit. So I think that, uh, Regardless of whether you work with lattice cutoffs or Fourier cutoffs, you're still going to have the same essential difficulty. Okay, so very good. Uh, I, I missed that, so I'd like to see more. Thanks. Okay. No worries. All right, so, um, so then we're almost like easing in the sense that if you forget about the purple, we just have the blue and red, then we're basically easing where easing now instead of, instead of really plus and minus one, we're like plus and minus one plus some error. Um, so, so the, the next step in, in, in our, you know, our campaign to treat this exactly like easing is to control uh, large fields. So, so what do I mean by this? Well, uh, let, let's just think just uh, very quickly about what this event means. Now, if everything was plus and minus, this means if you're very close to zero, so if you're this, this means the number of pluses and the number of minuses are basically zero, uh, are the same. However, with this, with this system, what can screw you over is if you have either a large number of fields which are, which are basically zero, so that, that means you're, you're localized a lot on this, on this, uh, on this hump, or your, your, let's say you're your plus one everywhere here, and then you're minus a billion here, or a 
okay, depends on how big your, big your system size is, but you're like minus n cubed there. So, so the, the way you can be screwed over by this, by this block average field phi, phi vec is either if there are lots of zero squares, but that's, that's uh, completely, that's uh, kind of killed by this, or if there is a block which, is, uh, which, is, which has an exceptionally large value. Um, it turns out that uh, using, using uh, you know, essentially the same mo moment bounds, sorry, the same moment bounds on, the, on these observables, you can also bound the occurrence of really large fields occurring. And that, that's essentially, you know, the intuition is, is really clear, the, the technical details are a bit painful, but the intuition is that if you are very large, you have, co you have a, a cortic potential. So the field really does not like to be there. And concretely, what 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 I'm uh, what does control a large field mean? It means that if you fix a very small fraction of the uh, of the um, blocks to be bad, so let's say uh, uh, you know delta of the volume, then uh, this implies necessarily that if you're on uh, if if you're away from the easing configuration and you also have zero magnetization. Then necessarily the integral over the bad blocks must be large, must be less than, greater than some something like this, where delta prime is something different. And then you can use the cortic tails to say, well, this is x, this is very unlikely as an event, and it's unlikely of volume order. So when we're looking at surface order effects, we can just completely disregard it. Okay. Now once we've got the powers estimate and once we've controlled large fields, then uh, then we are in the easing case, and and this is now. Um, this is now kind of, I guess, classical work from 20 years ago uh, and uh, related to this, yeah, I mean, this, what do you do? Well, you, you, you have to, you want to use some isoperimetry argument like Hendrik, Hendrik said, but you have to rule out the fact that the, the system might want to favor lots and lots of small O1 contours. So you want to control the phase of small contours and prove that there are macroscopic contours, not necessarily a unique one of order n squared. That, that would be really cool to prove, uh, but we can't do that uh, yet. Okay, so, um, all right, so uh, let's, yes. So, so is everyone uh, clear on how we prove it conditional on the fact that we can treat this, we can forget that we have ultraviolet divergences. And, and I, I am happy with emojis in the chat, for example. Um, I see no emojis, but I, I, I was, if, if, you, if you have any questions, just please let me know. Okay, so, so let's go into a bit more detail on the powers estimate. Um, so, so again, uh, if, if, you, if you remember, I mean, a block is bad if, it's, if uh, it isn't good, a plus good or minus good, where plus good means that uh, it's all, all of its star neighbors are localized in the plus well, and minus good means that all of its star neighbors are localized in the minus well. So what does it mean to be bad? Well, either there must be a block which is delocalized, so it lives in one of these regions, and so that, you know, the, this, this, the star block is, the star neighborhood is frustrated in a sense, or there must be an interface that forms within the star neighborhood. Um, so that's that's to say that every block every block in the in the star uh, in the star neighborhood is localized, but necessarily there is one plus and one minus in their nearest neighbors. Now, what's the point? Well, the point is is that the 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 occurrence of these bad blocks uh, when beta goes to um, uh, when beta is very very large is very very unlikely. Uh, so, so the precise bound is here. So so let, let me just introduce these first. So. so so Ron, I hope this answers your question exactly. So in order to pay for the occurrence of a frustrated block, you, you, essentially, you, you see this factor here. I mean, this is, this is in a sense suboptimal, but you see a, a, a large factor, which you know is beta to some power. And then you pay with this, with some random variable, which is, okay, I write it as cosh Q, but it's an exponential random variable. And, and here you should, you should see this as, this is going to be typically small, when phi, when phi squared is going to be roughly beta, okay? So, so uh, what this is, be because we're in low temperature, this is indeed the case that phi squared, you know, phi, phi is typically going to be beta. So phi squared, so root beta. So phi squared is typically going to be beta. 
and so and all the the lower order corrections are going to be killed by this scaling here outside um so so that's why when you look at the, the occurrence of frustrated blocks which is telling you that you're very far away it, it, you know you, you penalize it by the large value and you have this random variable you pay for uh which is in fact it, it's going to be subordinate to this factor when you take the expectation this term is a term that comes from uh, so, so I said that you, you know, you have this a Q1 term here, which tells you, you know, how how far phi squared is away from beta. The the thing is, because we're working with a continuum theory, uh, there's an there's a discrepancy between your coarse grain field phi block and the real field, and so when you take squares of this, you then have to deal with this discrepancy, and that's what this term does. And the fact that you can deal with it is a uh, it's an it's more of an analytic. Now the interface box is exactly what you, you know you bound it exactly how you imagine so so you use the fact that this is going to be penalized by the the gaussian part of your measure so the, the gradient phi okay so so in particular the probability of, of bad blocks occurring if you have o1 bounds on these cosh random variables so o1 and beta are going to be very very unlikely and you can imagine that to, to prove this piles estimate what you want to do is patch these together and uh, you want to be able to control moments of these cost QJs uh, over arbitrary collections of blocks. So in other words, whenever you see a frustrated block, you're going to see the occurrence of Q1 and Q2, uh, which tell you. And then whenever you see an interface block, you're going to see the occurrence of Q3. Then you sum over all possible uh, collections of blocks, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and uh, so then the, the final S that you want, which is going to tell you you can do Pyle's theory for continuum phi 4 in 2D or 3D, is exactly this estimate. So it tells you, you look at the product of blocks in B1 of cosh Q1, B2 cosh Q2, nearest neighbors in B3, and you're going to get something e to the O1, and then something which is extensive in their support. So the uniformity in beta is crucial, because otherwise you, you, you uh, screw up this very good damping term here. And the extensiveness support is also crucial because otherwise you're not going to see this. Um, now, now, like Ron said, you 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 can use chessboard estimates to reduce this to uh, to estimates on the on the on the free energy to obtaining O1 estimates on the free energy, which are extensive in the volume. Um, and uh, okay, the, the free energy and also some related quantities which involve the QJs, which if you remember from Hendrick's talk. He told you that the Bouet Dupree formula can be applied for your potential phi four potential plus something in the exponent. Now, the, the, this bound was really so. So, so in two D, this is this is what uh, Glim Jaffe and Spencer did, and uh, th their bound. I mean, getting this O one here doesn't extend readily to three D, um, and that's that's exactly what I'm going to spend the the remaining twenty five minutes, I think, uh, talking about. And the difficulty is, is that you have on the one hand, much stronger ultraviolet divergences. So in 2D, they're logarithmic with the cutoff and in 3D, they're polynomial. And then on the other hand, you have to deal with the non-convexity of the potential. So, so in other words, you want to somehow synthesize this uh, divergent behavior at small scales with a low temperature expansion at high scales, at large scales. Okay. So, so now there's a, a little bit of pain. Uh, don't worry, many of these things that you can look uh, that, that are on the slide, we, we're going to just forget about. But um, what I just wanted to introduce the, the, the real model you work with, just so at least it, it doesn't seem, uh, at, at least you can somehow get an appreciation that, all right, these estimates may look like they're trivial for the lattice model, but once you deal with, once you go into continuum, you have to fight a bit. So. So, so the model is really defined as, as a limit. So, so just jump the gun here. It's, it's, de it's defined as the weak limit of these ultraviolet cutoff measures. Um, and, and how do you define this? Well, you take, you fix your, your uh, Gaussian measure, which is, uh, we morally want a massless one, but we can put any, we can just put a mass here to avoid issues with zero Fourier modes. You take a field distributed according to this and regularize it by putting in a smooth Fourier cutoff. Then, um, we can just forget about this for now. But what you do is, if you, is you want to then, in fact, forget all about this. Let me let me even do something uh, better, so that you don't have to care about this. We're going to renormalize uh, the potential. Um, 
and I, I won't tell you what the renormalizations are. You just know that they're there. So, so, so here now we, we define uh, the, the uh, renormalized Hamiltonian as you take the potential uh, V beta of the regularized field phi K, and then you subtract appropriate counter terms. And then because we want to approximate a massless measure and we, we put in a false mass there, we're going to subtract something which cancels that out. Okay, so, so we have, a, um, we have a, an approximate measure, which is perfectly well-defined. It has a density with respect to the free field and uh, the partition function is well-defined. And uh, it, it's now classical back to Glim and Jaffe uh, in the seventies that these measures converge weakly to new beta N and there are many, uh, okay, Hendrik, oh, what's happened? Uh, hang on, I think I just need to stop my share and reshare. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know why it just cut out. Okay, so so um, okay, so now with these renormalized uh, with these renormalized potentials, uh, okay, the, the the measures converge weakly, and in, in fact, you know, we I should say here that for the people in the SPD community, you never see this delta k. It's just a constant renormalization, but it guarantees convergence of the partition functions. Anyway, so these classical techniques give you bounds on the free energy. However, the caveat is that this, this constant is going to depend on your temperature. And in fact, for low temperature, it's going to be very suboptimal. In fact, it's going to be linear in beta. And this is going to completely screw over the square root dependency that, that you need to kind of win. And the difficulty, like I said, is the fact that you have this, you have this, uh, this, this non-convexity here. And you also have this term here, which comes from the fact that we want morally a massless measure as our reference measure. So the diff to go to low temperature in both 2D and 3D, you have, to, you have to take into account this. In 2D, it turns out that, you know, because the renormalizations are, are, are much tamer, that you can just almost forget about them and just treat this. So in 3D, you're going to see that we can't do that, but, but we're going to find a way in, in other words, of course, graining so that we can effectively do that. That's that's essentially our the, 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 what makes. Uh, otherwise, this would be incredibly ugly, right? You'd have to do some sort of multi-scale. But it turns out that that there is a very beautiful coarse graining, which just separates the two scales almost magically, and that it's, it's completely you know this coarse graining looks somewhat trivial. It took us a very long time to figure out, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see it. So so just just to you know. Just to emphasize, the key difficulty in proving these powers estimates are O1 bounds on the partition function. Uh, and in fact, most of the difficulties in, in these Q bounds are also contained in, in just this upper bound, uh, just this lower bound on the free energy. So lower bound on the free energy is upper bound on the, on the, on the uh, expectation. Now, like Hendrik said, following Brashkov Gubinelli, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce some sort of fictitious time. Um, so, so we have a fixed, you know, we fix our ultraviolet cut off K and we kind of in continuously inter interpolate scales from zero to K. So it's like a renormalization uh, group type thing, but you do it continuously. This allows you to uh, represent these Gaussian expectations as functionals of the Brown in motion. And then once you're in the continuous time Martingale world, you can use, uh, you know, techniques like the Zarnold theorem to represent it as a stochastic control problem. So um, I have how long? Uh, I have like 15 minutes. Um, yes, yes. 15 minutes. So let me just see whether I want to skip this because I think Hendrik gave, uh, yeah, Hendrik talked about the Bruyere Dupree uh, and let me just remind you of some things about it. So, um, okay. So, so what does Bruyere Dupree tell us? It tells us that if you take a, uh, uh, this expectation. So this is the expectation with respect to mu n, the Gaussian of some observable of phi k, uh, some Hamiltonian of phi k, where h is measurable and bounded is not necessary. I, I'm stating it in the easiest case. Then, um, then you can represent it as the following stochastic control problem. So we take the infimum over all drifts. So the, this is uh, L2 in time and L2 in space uh, processors which are adapted to the, the underlying brand in motion. So now remember, we, we fix our perspective in Venus space. 
Um, and then we look at the, ha the, the Hamiltonian of, uh, of uh, instead of phi, we replace phi by the Gaussian free field plus a, uh, plus a, uh, a term derived from this little v, which is derived in exactly this way. So this jk here, you should think about as morally uh, the covariance operator, but decomposed in, 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 uh, in, in some way in, in Fourier space. So it's a, this is a decomposition of, uh, of uh, the covariance in, in, in Fourier space. Um, so, so let me just go back one slide. So sorry about this. I'm not doing this slide, but I just want to show you uh, what the JK is so that it, it's kind of, it's not mysterious. Well, here, you know, this is the cutoff. It's I think the square of the cutoff, but this is what it looks like in Fourier space, right? So it's flat on some modes and then it decays very fast and it's zero. So if you take the derivative, it's a bump function. It's like, a, it's a bump function support on an annulus in scale space. And in particular, if you integrate this over scales now, you recover the original, uh, the, the original row k squared, that's, that's obvious. But uh, now what we do is we just kind of impose that for the covariance. So, so we, this jk is just, imagine now you, this, this is your covariance and now we take the derivative of your covariance, okay? And so this, 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 this uh, lollipop k is built by integrations over these scales for these. For, for these. Uh, and uh, the kind of punchline is, is that uh, the law of it is exactly the law of, of, of phi k. So, so it's a bit more nuanced than what Hendrik was, uh, was, was showing you last time. Uh, and in fact, it, it's kind of necessary and, and we won't see it today. Um, but it, it's related to the fact that in three dimensions, uh, you start to see mass renormalization uh, because, because uh, certain functionals of, the, uh, of uh, the GFF start to blow up. Okay, so, so anyway, the Broglie Dupuis, what does it say? Well, you take the GFF, you perturb it by this, this, uh, this integrated drift where the integration is related to the, the covariance uh, of, of this. Um, and then uh, you, you have to pay because you shifted this by a relative entropy term. Um, so, it, so, uh, so I can even just rub this out because Hendrik mentioned this, but it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's a version of the Gibbs variational principle, which, okay, if you remember kind of classically, it says that you take uh, the infimum over all Q absolutely continuous measures, and then you have the energy plus the entropy term. So that's energy, that's entropy. Okay, now let me spend uh, th two minutes showing you uh, some of the problems. So if you just put in phi four and uh, we, we, you know, you always have to wick order. Wick order just means you take the, the fourth uh, Hermite polynomial of phi four. Um, so if you, if you take just the wick ordering and you, and you forget about the other counter terms for a moment and you apply the braid Dupree, well, then what do we do? We, we calculate h of lollipop plus v, and we're going to get lollipop plus v wick ordered, whatever this means. And then we're going to see uh, the integral of the fourth wick power of the Gaussian free field. Uh, that's, okay, it's just the fourth Hermite polynomial of it, plus the third Hermite polynomial tested against this capital V. You know, this is just, uh, this is just binomial theorem, plus stuff. Now, in three dimensions, you should start to be a bit worried because this looks super scary because it does not, I mean, it blows up in variance certainly as k goes to infinity, but something that's particularly nice is in this formula, we have the expectation outside. And, uh, and so when we take the expectation of this inside the control problem, this term is gonna vanish because it's a martingale. So you can write it as an iterative stochastic integral. Okay, but that, that doesn't save us. Um, this term, you cannot do the same thing. Uh, because V is not deterministic, it, it's adapted to the Brownian motion. Uh, and uh, in fact, this is, this is going to blow up invariance. So, so the very beautiful idea that, uh, that uh, uh, Nikolai Barashkov and Gubinelli had was to, to kind of use some of the ideas that came from, I think, yeah, I, I mean, inspired by this SPD literature that, you know, I, I said that phi is, is, is uh, this lollipop plus V, right? But in the stochastic PD literature, this V has a further description in terms of functionals of the, of the, so 
you know, more functionals of the Gaussian free field plus other stuff. And if you, if you just put this in, then actually this term also diverges. So, so the idea is that you have now two, two things which are, you know, which are not finite. Can you use one of them to cancel the other? And concretely, it's done by using a, a um, it's concretely done by, by using a, a, a change of variables in the drift. So I won't, I won't go into this, but uh, anyway, it's a very nice thing. And uh, if, if we want to discuss it after, we can. Uh, but but that's, that's, I hope you see the idea that you have now in the variational formula, uh, you have these bad terms which appear in the integrals, but you also have this, this entropy term, which is in fact going to diverge. And so you're going to use the two to, 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 to cancel out the divergences and see something finite, fingers crossed. Of course, uh, I was cheating a bit because this term is also bad um, because this, this is in C minus one minus, and this is at best in H1. So from a regularity perspective, you can't test this. And, uh, and, and to, to, you, you can still cancel most divergences using this kind of technique, but now your drift ansatz, your, your change of variables, is going to uh, rely on the, the, the drift itself. So it's gonna become much more uh, subtle. Okay. So, so, so now back to bounding the partition function. I've, so, I've showed you the problems of the ultraviolet limit. And uh, I, I, I've also hinted at the problems with the, the infrared limit. Now let's see, the pro let's try and just mesh them together naively and see what happens. Well, okay, what, 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 what's the overall strategy for, for using this Bray Dupree to bound the partition function? Well, we have minus log Z is the infimum of the expectation of some uh, cost function. Now this cost function is the Hamiltonian of the lollipop plus the V plus the drift entropy term. So the energy plus the entropy. The aim is to find a good term in this expansion such that we can write the, the cost function as an error or whatever you want to call it, R, plus a, the good term. And for th this good term has to be positive. And then we bound this, um, this, this uh, remainder term by a bunch of norms of stochastic objects plus uh, a little bit of the good term. So that, those are kind of uh, harmonic an uh, analysis type estimates. Then when you take the expectation of this, we can, we can uh, forget about the stochastic terms, the O1, because there's no beta dependence in our, in our GFF, plus this good term, which in a sense encodes the beta dependence. Um, and, and this is positive and we can just trash it. So in, in other words, we get uh, then an O1 bound. But what's the difficulty is choosing GK. How, how do you choose GK, the good term? Well, if you, if you do uh, the, the, the kind of the most obvious one, which is to choose the L4 norm and this, this, this occurs in the potential, you just, just believe me, then, then uh, you fail because uh, again, this is due to non-convexity issues. Similarly, you may want to choose the, poten the whole potential and then you also fail because uh, of this negative mass term, which, which we want to put in to approximate a, a massless Gaussian measure. So, so the kind of, one of the key ideas, uh, so, so in this course graining, there are two key ideas. I mean, it's, it's one key idea, but two steps. So the first step is to choose the good term. And for that, we split uh, this term here. So this is this I told you was bad because of the negative mass, but we really want to use this. Well, what we do is we sacrifice a little bit of this and as, a, as a good stability term for our estimates. And then we have this term here, which looks like a low temperature potential, which, hope, which hopefully, we can decouple from the ultraviolet behavior and then treat using statistical mechanics. So, so by treat using statistical mechanics, what I mean is we want to do a low temperature expansion. So we write the partition function as a, as a sum of, of shifted partition functions, where what we do is we choose, you know, for each of these, fix an easing configuration on our, block, on our boxes and enforce that the block averages of the field are going to be agreeing with the um, with the the signs of the easing configurations and, and then shift it so that the new mean of this field is small so so uh, if you if you imagine locally on each box you just what you do is you you have this term here and you have this term here and you just shift the field so that you recenter things about one of the wells so what I'm I mean it's 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 uh, conceptually I think it's not hard uh, to, to to visualize but the, but there's some subtleties in continuum that you can't actually do that translation it's not 
you have to then approximate the translation, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so, so you, you do this. Yes, there's someone who is sighing. <laughs> Uh, don't worry, we are we are almost done, and I know this is uh, potentially a bit painful, but um, bear with me. You, you you'll see the nice part in exactly one minute time. So so you know we, we do this low temperature expansion of the partition functions, and then we we use the Bouet Dupree formula for each of these partition functions. So in other words, we're going to see an extra term here, which is some log of products of indicators or whatever. It's going to be the the, the thing that enforces you to be your, your block averages to be plus or minus. And then we're going to do, so this is the second part, we're going to do some sort of coarse graining. And uh, let, let me show you the coarse graining. So, so yeah, again, apply the braided pre, blah, blah, blah. Now, the, the key thing, if you want to take anything back from this, is that if you just did a block averaging or even a finite range type decomposition, you'd start chopping and changing the potential. And that's a very dangerous thing to do when you want to then also analyze the, the continuum limit at the same time. So it turns out that if you just take the, take the, the field, which is, you know, remember phi was this plus V, and then there's this G here that appeared, and that's just because I, I did the shift here, but forget the G. And then if you just do the coarse graining of the, of the Gaussian field that underlies it, then this exactly decouples the large scale behavior into an effective Hamiltonian, which is, uh, which is something which is defined point wise, uh, plus the ultraviolet divergences in the remainder term, plus the stability term. So the, eff the effective Hamiltonian is, is, is this. So you have the, the low temperature potential minus this recentered negative mass term, plus this, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this term that enforces the mean to be in agreement with this easing spins. Then, uh, then to bound this is essentially uh, what, uh, I mean, okay, I guess this is even older, but and Glim, Jaffe, and Spencer had done this already. And uh, essentially what you do is you use that, all right, well, if you're recentered about here, forget all this stuff if you want to, you just look at the pictures. If you're recentered about here, well, then we're, we're okay in this region because there the cortic well is dominating the Gaussian part. The only part where we're screwed is this region. But if we've localized around here and the field is there, well, it can't be caused because by this uh, block average because, because of the way we did our expansion. And therefore, higher order fluctuations must be pushing the field here. But we can control higher order fluctuations, uh, which is encoded in this thing, by the uh, underlying Gaussian in, in our field. OK, so, 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 so uh, I hope you, you, you've now seen that how you treat the large scale behavior. That's this. That's uh, the low temperature expansion plus you bound fluctuations. Uh, you've seen how to do ultraviolet ones. That's these drifty compositions plus these uh, harmonic analysis, an analysis estimates. And then the, the, the only idea which hopefully I uh, you take home today, if anything, is that th this, the, you know, by just coarse graining the, the, the Gaussian, the underlying Gaussian in this variational framework, you really cleanly separate the two things and, uh, and see the, the, the two behaviors kind of almost independently. I'm lying a bit, but almost independently. So in the post credits, which I hope maybe I have like two or three minutes and just to just to uh, do I have two or three minutes for post credits. Yes. OK, so just to, just, you know, if you found some of the technical detail a bit painful, let's just kind of abstract away. And I just want to show you some uh, some of the more kind of what I think are really nice questions that, that follow up on this. So 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 let's just start with something which I think is is perhaps not too difficult to do and uh, one is to, to kind of develop this into a full kind of low temp or contour expansion for 543 uh, and to construct pure states. So this relates to the question last time where someone was asking about negative mass. Well, if you put boundary conditions, you, you, you do get exponential decay of correlations. So, so can we actually construct these pure states uh, and can we find higher order corrections to the spontaneous magnetization, just like Glim Jaffe and Spencer did in, in 2D? And another natural direction, which I think shouldn't, I mean, it shouldn't be impossible is to construct Dobrushin states in 3D. Uh, so, so in a sense, I, I feel like the key difficulty, which was to, to find the way of dealing with uh, ultraviolet and infrared behavior cleanly for 543, is, is, has already been done by us. And then to do this, you have to somehow patch these together with known statistical mechanics arguments. So it's a bit less revolutionary. Then, that's, uh, then, okay, the questions hopefully come, become more interesting, but uh, something which, I, you know, 
I, I'm my interests are a little shifting towards uh, lattice statistical mechanics, and there, even the non-existence of interfaces for five four two is it's still it's a really interesting question. I think. Okay. So uh, finally, just to kind of close this low temperature discussion, uh, remember we, our theorem was a was an upper bound on this probability that the magnetization is approximately zero. Well, what's the what's the rate function? Uh, is there a relation to wolf shapes like there is for easing? And can we characterize the spec the decay of the spectral gap by this rate function just like you can do for stochastic easing in two D? I don't know about three D. Uh, and something which uh, has, you know, I've been thinking about more and more, uh, you know, phi4 was the, the model which, which is in my childhood, and, and now I've, I realize there are other models in statistical mechanics. Um, so, so, so these lattice, uh, so these um, continuous spin models in 3D, there, there, are, uh, there is a, a very long renormalization group proof of uh, the spin wave picture for, for ON models. And low temperatures by Balaban, and it would be interested whether interesting whether any of these techniques can be useful, for example, for X Y in low temperature to prove something about it, because you see it's an it's I, I think you know the, one of the take homes should be that this Bouet Dupuis is actually pretty cool to estimate exponential observables of five four theories or of uh, other quartic theories. Okay, and post credits too. Um, so this is a. I think now that we are going to holy grails, and I hope that we do discuss this um, in the questions. But so so Hendrik mentioned the phase transitions for the dynamics. Where let me remind you that the the spectral gap for the for the two D stochastic easing undergoes a trichotomy, and that's uh, in in the high temperature regime it's O one, and that's really sharp up to the critical point. Then in the low temperature regime it is exponentially decaying in the side length. And the criticality, there's a slowdown with bounds on the polynomial growth, which are apparent, well, which I think are far away and, and from the observed value of 2.17 in, in according to some experiments. And, and the question is, which is a bit, you know, science fiction is, does this hold for 5.4 SPD or in fact, even lattice dynamics, I think is interesting. And our result is a, it's like a baby step towards the low temperature part because we're very far away from criticality. So, so, so just uh, let me carry on with the Holy Grails and then there's two more and that's it. Uh, these two Holy Grails and then that, that's it. So one is, what is the question mark? Well, I, I don't know if, it, if it's uh, even understood that this is the right value, um, whether 2.17 is the right value. Um, and, and uh, you know, is this, is this question mark universal? So, you know, 5.4 is perhaps too much science fiction, but something which is not too crazy, you can imagine, is looking at something like, easing with non with, with uh, next nearest neighbor interactions with some very weak coupling or something and trying to see if there's a, a universality type result in in the for, for the dynamics so so thank you very much for for staying with uh, with us to the end and uh, I hope at least you know if, if the technical details got a bit painful you could at least glimpse that there are some elegant parts to this as well so so that's it thank you thanks a lot. So I would uh, now ask everybody to unmute uh, so that we can uh, thank uh, Trisha all together. So there is, uh, we have seen some minutes for uh, questions. Yes, uh, uh, Stephen. Fantastic talk, uh, Trish. Uh, so you're looking at these holy grails. You're focused on the question of exponents, but you're, what about the uh, temporal exponents? Because when you quench to a critical point from a homogeneous state, there's also a, din a dynamical scaling exponent. So have you thought about that holy grail? <laughs> and I haven't the, thought the about these holy grails, uh, but that that's even, an even harder problem, no? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're pushing the you're pushing the envelope, so I thought I'd mention it. Right. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question, but I think that's much harder. And already this seems like it's out of reach. Um, so yeah. Okay. That, that's no, but very... for, an, for an ambitious young man, nothing's out of reach. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Maybe my my second question, if I could, relates to the role of dimensions. So again. I'm uh -huh. partly in the boundary of things I don't fully understand, just the cultural knowledge. But the critical points in 2D, these are correlated to conformal field theories, yeah? Uh -huh. 
And so the, the 2D conformal field theories are super rich because the symmetry group is infinite dimensional. So, so is there any uh, uh, aspect of trying to establish the existence of these uh, symmetry groups, the, the conformal invariance? Are you also able to access that type of symmetry as you look at these critical points? I mean, we are so far away from the critical point. And, uh, ah, I mean, sorry, I missed, yeah. Yeah, so we, we are very far away from the critical point. But I mean, in 2D, it's a relevant question to ask, you know, something about the universality of uh, easing. So looking at phi four at the critical point. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, I don't think these techniques are going to help you. But, that, but for example, doing, looking at geometric um, uh, interpretations of, these, of phi four, like, like, for example, people have done of easing is the, is the better way to go. And uh, th I think that's actually a relevant question because you see that this, uh, this question mark here, uh, Sly and Lubetsky use, um, use uh, RSW theory for FK, I think, for FK easing. Uh, and, and there's a valid question of whether you can think of extending this if you, to, to you know, five, four maybe, but, you know, uh, easing with finite range interactions, if you could, if you could uh, do the very hard problem of extending these estimates to that case. Thanks a lot, Trish, and keep up the enthusiasm and energy. <laughs> Thanks. So is there uh, some other question? So I have a question, uh, mm -hmm. more basic. So this, uh, this model comes out as the limit of the easing model of the, so with uh, this uh, two, uh, two, two scales limit or the uh, CAS model. But uh, so you have always worked with uh, um, the standard lattice. Uh, can it uh, uh, comes also from uh, come also from uh, triangular so some uh, discrete mode on the triangular lattice, for example, or something like this? So is it clear the question? So if you change the lattice, can you have uh, some um, Easing model on the on triangular lattice and so on in order to have uh, uh, the same uh, uh, continuum model when you rescale. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, so since you talk about universality, yeah, I, I see your point. Okay, in, um, other, in other form of universality. Yeah, I, I see your point. Um, uh, I, I think that's. I, I don't really know if anyone has looked at taking continuum limits on, on these, on, on different graph structures and whether there's, I, I don't know is the honest answer. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, thanks anyway. Is, is there some other Sandra, I think it's, I think, I mean, this cuts thing, you need to do this, this long range interaction. I think the, the structure of the lattice is basically washed out. I don't think if you have a reasonable approximation to, to a continuum, then, then it'll work. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, is there some other question? Okay. Um, okay, the speaker already gave uh, a lot of questions, so open questions. Oh, uh, Roma has, uh, does this give you some information oh, about the geometry? Thanks, I do. Ah, uh, yes, it, it does give you, so, so we can prove the existence of macroscopic contours where macroscopic here means it's greater than n to the one, n to some power, I can't remember, but it's not n squared. Um, and we would want to prove that there is a, a macroscopic contour of order n squared. Um, I don't know, I mean, this has been done for easing. I, I would imagine that with some work, you could do so for, for this model, but I don't know how interest, or I, I don't know whether I'm gonna go down that direction. If, I mean, okay, if you see a way of doing it, then go for it. Okay, thanks a lot. Is there some other question? Yes, yes. Thomas. Uh, hi, I, uh, I enjoyed your talk. I, but I have a question about whether you can do without using some kind of chessboard reflection positivity. Can this Bouillet Dupuis help you in this regard? Uh, that's a very good question. That's a, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, so, I'm not entirely sure. I think you, I do, yeah. So, so without reflection positivity, I think in 2D you, you do it, right? With uh, this, uh, you have a full low temperature expansion. So you essentially don't do something, you, you don't cancel the partition function. Uh, 
and I think maybe you have some hope of doing that to 3D now. Uh, but if you mean that you want to see, you want to just apply Bure Dupuy to these Kosh things, so let me just go back to it. So, so if you mean you just apply a Bure Dupuy to this and then you see the, the, the extensivity in the boxes, I think that's a fantastic question. That's something that Hendrik and AJ and I were thinking about. Uh, and we got stuck, but we weren't sure whether it's impossible or whether we weren't clever enough in the moment. So, so I think that's fair. You see, the, the thing is, is that you, you, you get, you know, you take a log of, yeah. So you want to look at the variational problem to this. You're going to get the infimum over V of this uh, one of the koshas minus the infimum of V of the, of the free thing, right? Of the partition function which is just going to have the five four potential. And then you see for every V here, you can choose a drift here. And the idea would be to choose it so that you cancel out the mass of the drift away from the support of these boxes, right? And I can imagine that for something which is like just a box, this is going to be difficult, but it may be possible, but uh, yeah. I don't know, Tom, did you, did, you vague, did you see my point there with writing the to control problems? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. So, so the, the, you know, the, the difficulty here, so I should say that Nikolai Barashkov uh, has been able to use that to, uh, for sine Gordon, which is much easier because you have a bound of potential, but still an interesting proof that you can prove mass gap for sine Gordon for low, uh, for low beta in infinite volume limit. So, oh, he's so used that to get a gap uh, uh, in the continuum or? In the continuum, yeah. Lattice? In the continuum. In the continuum. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I, I, I don't know, Hendrik. Have you thought about this problem more? Not much more than than what we discussed. I think it's a very interesting question, and uh, I'm still sad that we didn't manage at the time. So, so <laughs> uh, could I also ask about? Uh, uh, Hendrik mentioned that you can use this to uh, to get stability for, let's say, something simpler like five four two, right? Yeah. So, so then Bouillet Dupuis is useful for this case or, or not? Did I understand that or correctly? Now, I'm uh, talking about ultraviolet now, another matter. I mean, Hendrik, you mentioned you had a proof. There was another proof. I mean, the, the classical proof is, is using Nelson's, you know, ultra uh, hypercontractivity, that kind of thing. So do you have a substitute for that? Yes, the, I mean, that's actually much easier than the 543 proof. So that's sort of what I tried to show in my one slide at the very end. So the, uh, if you look at this really fantastic paper by, by Gobinelli and Barashkov, um, they have to warm up, they solve the, the 2D case and it takes them half a page. And then they spend the next 30 pages with, with, the, with, the, 3D, with the 3D case. So they- so, um, and to, so that you can get stability very quickly using, uh, I mean, yeah without using Nelson's, I mean, Nelson's work is not so hard, but it's still, it's, so this bypasses that. Absolutely, no, I mean, it's really, it's really very, it's really immediate to write down this, um, this put this Russia, this put P formula for this. And in this case, you can really do this very, you don't have to do a complicated scale decomposition for this field, you really do the Brownian motion as I, as I showed. Mm -hmm. And then you just look at this variational principle and you need a little bit of, I mean, of course, you need to calculate the weak powers of the of the Gaussian field, obviously, but you don't need very much. It's very easy. So if you look at the proof, it takes half a page. That, okay, yeah. I mean, it all, um, what I showed on the slide was almost a complete proof, and this was one slide. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so maybe, okay, let us see if there is some uh, very quick question, some other very quick question. Okay, so if not, I would uh, invite everybody to unmute so that we can thank uh, both the speaker together. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, okay, uh, have a nice uh, Eastern break. There will be no uh, one more probability seminar next week. So there is a break and uh, Nina Gunter and uh, Julien uh, Berestiki will uh, uh, continue uh, as moderators. So I thank also all the participants. Okay, who we'll stay until the end. <laughs> okay, we have a little uh, taken uh, some minutes, minutes more. Okay, but it's okay.
Okay, thanks. Thanks to everybody.